sell that old stuff, or you could pretend. No, it was. look, look. I've given all that stuff away to charities, and you know, I don't take no credit for that. But I'm not going to hoard it and then make a load of money on it. You know, I'm sorry, but that goes to orphans and kids that count, yeah. right? Because you actually do... And not show business. But this is the bizarre thing. I know you didn't particularly want to mention this, but you actually do do a lot of work for kids and stuff, don't you, in LA? Yeah, but keep it quiet. Yeah, that is... <laughs> how remarkable is that? And actually genuinely no, wants to keep it quiet. it's important that it be quiet. When I see these loudmouth charity, like, orchestrators, uh, they offend me, because that means they're doing it for their own ego and not for the people that matter. So anything to do with kids... That's our future. You give it up to them. Your early days with your parents being brought up in Finsbury Park in the late 50s. Um, <laughs> they, I was born in 56. <laughs> there you go. Let's be specific. Um, they, they weren't easy times. Can you tell us a bit about no, those, those, those were really, really bad times. Uh, um, before Finsbury Park, we lived on Benwell Road. It was a two-roomed... Uh, ground floor flat. There was no real plumbing, there was no hot water, there was an outdoor public toilet which was our only luxury and the rats of course would, would, would break in and, and piddle all over anything you had and so that's how I became contaminated and I had a bout of meningitis where I went into a coma for four months and I lost my memory. So you were how old when, when you got meningitis? Seven. And uh, how aware were you what was going on? I mean, it was, uh, that's a serious thing to happen to somebody that young at that time. Um, did, were you... I suppose no, but you know, there's no great grief or tragedy in this, right? There isn't, because as a kid, you just don't know any better. And I think kids are tougher than adults anyway. How did you, I mean... I, but, talk... but four months in a coma and then the rest of the year uh, in, a, in a hospital not knowing anybody. Do you think that what made it easier for you to just get on with it, to deal with your illness um, and, and to, to have that, that secure have family? Choice. You didn't have a choice. But for your mum and your dad to cope with it... Uh, oh, they, they must Irish, have gone through hell. But they were Irish Catholics um, yeah. and, and Catholicism was, was part of your day, was part of your week? Was it, was it there or was it present in your family? Well, thank God I lost my mind because it never came back, that part. <laughs> Uh, you can't deny what you were brought up as. Uh, that would be foolish. And there's, some, there's some, probably some excellent things in, in Catholicism. I don't know if it's much to do with the religion as a state-run institution. It's more to do with the family value thing and how people communicate. We, you use the church as a social gathering place. And that's where you'd meet other, other family members, friends. And, and there'd be, of course, there'd be a bar out back after. All right, you know, with cheap ale. Mm. Uh, a good, good way of uniting people and a uh, knees up. You did actually go to um, a Catholic school as a, young, as a young lad. How was that experience for you? Murder for me. Really, really severe. Because I'm left handed and because uh, it was run by nuns. Um, their whole problem was that left handed meant you were a sign of the devil. So you would be hit on the knuckles with a ruler until you learned to write with your right hand. It's, it's, it's unforgivable, really. Do you, do you carry... Hated them, for, hated them for that for a long, long time. And then, of course, they tried to push me into being an altar boy or joining the choir. And so I think from about 10, 9, 10, I started to, to perfect uh, an anti-voice so that I wouldn't get pulled into that. And so I deliberately learned how not to sing, which put me in good stead years later, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this, I mean, this... You know, you don't always get everything right. <laughs> this, um, I mean, did that rebellious streak just come from being in a place that you didn't like, or was it in your no, family as well? Was it present no, in your dad? Or... My, my, my dad will tell you I was always a willful little brat, you know, before and after. That didn't go away. It was a strange relationship with, with my dad, because uh, the day I got on really well with him was the day I left home, and he kicked me out for having... Uh, well, he told me to get my hair cut, because it was extremely long. At really? At 15. So I did. I went out, I had it cropped short and dyed bright green, and he called me a cabbage. Get off the horse, you damn cabbage! <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and since then, we're all right, you know? Where did you go when your dad said, out with your green hair, then? What no. happened next? Um, uh, I ran into Sid, who was a mate yeah. of mine for a while, and, uh, and we found his squat in Hampstead that night. Hampstead? I mean, there's going up in the world, isn't it? So how did we go from meeting Sid in Hampstead, in this kind of the world that, you know, is open for taking, um, to being locked in to, like, the biggest 
commercial, in a sense, happening in music for, for so long, the Sex Pistols. Yeah, well, that's a nice premise, but none of that's true. We weren't the biggest commercial success. We never have been, and I don't think we ever will be. We didn't do that for money. We did it for the pure bleeding love of it, of the thing. All right? None of us had any hope. We come from very different backgrounds, and very different likes and dislikes, us as a band. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm an avid reader and writer. And so turning that quickly into writing songs was great because the one thing that the other three didn't have was any potential to put word to paper or to express their, their feelings. They could express it musically but not verbally. You know, that, that's how things work in life. Different people have different gifts. That's why I, I don't believe in, um, in the communist thing, we're all equal. We're not. Some, some are better at some things than others. It's those variations that make us extremely excellent as a, as a species. So, uh, at the time, what, what was this thing that was the Sex Pistols? You just called it a thing. It what, was, a, what was it? an excellent opportunity to hit back at all the things that were really bothering any and, any and all that? of us. No hope. Hopelessness. Well, the the schools, the school systems would be telling you, you t why bother? Right? You, you never get anywhere, right? Hence the song, No Future. No Future for you? Well, there won't be if you don't get up and do it yourself. Don't let them grind you down. No, you right? mm. right? And you see the, the, the Catholic thing in there. We all know that that's riddled with guilt, right? Well, I got rid of that at a very early age. No religion should have guilt in it. It shouldn't. It should be joy and love and hope. And you don't have any trace of that with you now? No, all. when I do wrong, I'll say so. You know, I will stand up, sir, and confess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but not 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 to a, a man in a dress in a little box. <laughs> Did you have a sense at the time then that you would be you would make a difference to maybe no. people like yourselves, kids that were coming at that time from places no, that you'd come no. from? It was just about the only chance that was there. It was waved at me like a, a you know a red flag to a bull. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ha ha! I don't have to sell drugs. You know, it's as simple as that. Really? Yeah. That's your motivation right there. Were you surprised at the time when people were terrified of playing oh, the music on, on the radio? Yeah. Yeah, they were right. scared of you in interviews. They were, you were walking out. There was let's all say, this bad behaviour. Let's, behavior, say, I let's mean. say I was playing with a very sharp stick. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll yeah. give you that. Did you enjoy it? Did you, did you love you know, that, that, that love bit it. of the behaviour? Loved it, loved it, loved it. And the worse they threw at me, the worse I'd get in return. All right, I'm good at that, tit for tat, and the word is a powerful thing. It can be a weapon of mass destruction. You're carefully used. You cannot put a censorship on words, on language. As a species, we're, we are an amazing creation. Our language makes us superior to any other species on this planet, and we should absolutely adore ourselves for that. And for a complete stranger to tell me to limit my vocabulary, I won't tolerate it. I won't, I won't. So. One of the nice things that happened to you when you were younger in your 20s was that you met your Nora. wife. Nora. Yes, 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 absolutely. Oh, we rowed like cats and dogs when we first met. <laughs> absolutely. How did you meet? What, was, what um, were the circumstances? Oh, uh, so I think it was Chris Spedding t t took her to a gig to see the Sex Pistols and uh, she just thought we were awful. <laughs> you know it's going to work and, when that happens. And, and I was the worst thing in it. And... Uh, and then people telling, oh, don't talk to him, he's horrible. So from there on in, it, it clicked really well. <laughs> what kind of a person is she? What kind, I mean, what... Very, very open, very forward, no lying at all, mm. as honest as the day is long, which, of course, infuriates a lot of people because they just don't like honesty. We love each other very much, and we've been together now 25 years. That takes some doing. I mean, it, it can be difficult, yeah, because of my workload, but... You know, she knows she could trust me, and I, I know the same, and that's all that matters. And I mean, look, I, I'll go on a bit further. I mean, you know, why don't we have kids? Well, we wanted to, but we had a very, very bad tragedy there a long while back, and we lost one, and uh, now it's not, it's not possible after that. And so that kind of, that, that mullered us up a bit there. That upset us both very much. Because Nora had know, a kid, didn't she? She had a child. Ariana of Ariana. the Slits, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, who, who, who uh, are in turn, she has, uh, Ariana has three kids of her own and, uh, and the, the two twins, who are now 21, they've lived with us since, since 13. And uh, so you're a granddad now, aren't you? I am. 
How does being a granddad feel? Johnny Rotten's a granddad. It's all right. The parent teacher association meetings are a <laughs> huss scream. <laughs> I recommend you film them. <laughs> what kind of a granddad are you? And what do they, I mean, what do they I'm call a you? Good one, and I'm loyal. Explain this eternal contradiction with you, though, because these are such traditional values. The uh, things that, yes, of liking manners and family no, values. No, tradition, and yes. Morals. You can call it all of these things. But they're there for a reason. It's how the human race has managed to survive for so long without us going completely crazy. But it happens quite naturally in nature. All right? And we stick labels on it and call it traditional. But it happens quite naturally in nature. And we must not lose our basic instincts over modern doctrines. All right? Follow your instincts and you'll be going the right way with life. Are you still angry? Did you get worn out by my resilience. Not me, I wondered if you were getting worn out. Anger is an energy. I will always have that energy. I have the energy to send up for the disenfranchised. I believe in what I do. I am resilient. I lost my memory at seven. It took me four years to recover that from a childhood illness. I love you. I love everything that is real, true and solid. My name is John Lydon. I was born the 31st of the 1st, 1956. That's new. My early childhood memories were Benwell Mansions. That was a complete slum. Damp, smelly, vile Victorian monstrosity of a building. Until aged 11, we were lucky enough to be able to move to Six Acres Estate, Finsbury Park. This is where I spent most of my early childhood. It's different. It's neater, the fixtures and fittings are nicer because my mum and dad had awful, hideous taste. There's two chairs there for my mum and dad, that's where they'd sit. In that far corner there was uh, two budgies and a hamster which uh, we used to call Sid Vicious. In fact, that's where the name Sid Vicious comes from, named him after my hamster. You know, he used to look a bit like a hamster because he had kind of slightly bucked teeth and it was a little white thing, it was a very friendly little hamster. And Sid was a very friendly chap before the drugs took hold of him. I was seriously ill most of my early life. I had meningitis and I slipped into a coma for three months and when I woke up I had no idea who I was or who anybody was. And my mother really had to coax me back into remembering who they even were. I mean, that's a terrible thing not to know your own parents for a long time. And that caused a lot of damage to me and the people around me. This is the kitchen. Again, all modern nice appliances. What strikes me is uh, how all the different episodes of my life here are all now come crashing in and I, I'm not kind of coordinating them at, at age appropriately, as, you know, a series of events. They're all colliding at once. So forgive me if I jump from one subject to another, but it's fairly flooding my head right now. And it's not a pleasant feeling. <laughs> we had a little table, which is approximately the size of that tiny little one there. But that was there. And on that table, when I used to make my own tea, um, that's where I wrote God Save the Queen. God Save the Queen! The fascist regime! I just took out a pen, found a piece of paper, and just wrote it all in one go call that poetry if you want and this is the bedroom seemed so much bigger when i was younger those window frames permanently leaked permanently damp mold black mold on the walls i remember that because it used to make me ill all the time this is where i just would sit for hours playing captain beefheart reggae bits of soul that i liked bits of everything really but it would be always causing arguments, right? There'd be these neighbours up above called the Skinners and they never liked what I was playing. And then there'd be the mother and father units downstairs in the kitchen banging upwards. So it's boom, bang, boom, bang. <laughs> the sadness that's coming back to me now is because my mum died. And when she died, I kind of emotionally left this place. So that's now flooding into my head. 
odd. I'd like to say, if you're listening, Mum, thank you, love you, you raised me well. I'm doing all right. See you soon. Peace out. I've always viewed myself as a victim, so I'm always there for the, uh, the, uh, the disenfranchised. What, what do you make of the politics of today? Vile nonsense, stupidity, lying and deceit, of course, will always be a part of the political agenda. But worse, but than, the, the worse than the protests I, I that you had with the sex They protests. sound to me, and they come across to me, modern politicians, particularly in Britain right now, as uneducated morons. They've been to Eton. They're overprivileged. Oh, yes. They've been to Eton. Is the revolution complete? No. Uh, it, it's, what I'm doing isn't about um, adding new agendas to people. It's uh, making things more acceptable, which would be fine by me. Uh, I don't want to like, be judged. Like what? Well, I don't want to be judged as being like a total revolutionary because I'm not interested in that. Society can carry on doing what society does. Um, I've had problems from childhood and the book deals with that. Now, when I uh, recovered, for instance, from meningitis, if you can call it recovery, it took me four years to find my, my full memory the pain you go through of not remembering your own parents. It took a lot out of me to have to go back into my childhood and, and, and face that pain and, and, and thereby really regurgitate the, the death of my parents and, and the lonely isolationism of that. Now, I don't think I've ever made up to my mum and dad and they're dead now and it breaks my heart. I've never made up for them for the fact that I forgot who they were. Really, my message through my music is really bloody learn to love each other properly because you only get one go at it. Oh, I'm going to cry now. God bless, mate. Thanks for having us. John Lydon, a.k.a. Johnny Rotten.